And thanks for staying with us here on the Journey Channel. Just gone by as the uh, national chairperson of the NDC, Johnson Asiru Nkichi, addressing uh, what the NDC describes as its true uh, state of uh, the nation. We'll be crossing you back um, shortly. Uh, but uh, just to turn our attention to a hotline documentary where some residents were the factories uh, that the president promised is supposed to be constructed are beginning to uh, ask uh, the government to work and to ensure that some of these uh, folding up companies are revived. There's more in this report for you. Like the Central, Eastern, Volta, Western, Greater Accra, Western North, the OT region, and many other regions we have covered in this documentary, the Shanti region is no exception. Here, many of the factories that are captured in the records of the One District One Factory Secretariat under the Ministry of Trade and Industries as factories that have been completed and operational were not so. If they say there's a plantain factory that's operating here, it's a lie. Fact checking has been recognized as one of the potent tools for journalists, but residents who are mostly farmers here decided to fact check the claims of their MP and government. Here at Agogo, there are abandoned raw materials that should make any factory that was promised farmers flourish. But the farmers here say there is no factory to cater for their needs, contrary to the claims by the MP for the area. Plantain factory, no say yes, here we are. Baby, I'm sure I'm seeing no no. I want to know a couple. If they have indeed said that there is a plantain factory that's operating here, it's not true. The same route we take when we are going to farm, and we've seen no vehicle, no process planting for export. I have not seen any factory like that operating in this area. In the eastern region, government has indicated that 43 factories have signed up to the one district one factory policy and have received support already 22 of such factories the ministry indicates are operating while 18 are under construction for three of the factories there is a tag on them as pipeline factories but it's become a tale full of reasons why many of the factories are not operating and their impact not felt in the Ghanaian economy as opposed to what government has envisaged. Uh, one is what factory is a concept. I bought into it and felt say uh, I could also do something. Assurance uh, in your end is uh, about to The assurance we got was that government through the Exim Bank will give us some loans, support our factory we've done all that is required of us but also no avail the full thing is uh, later on the journey channel let's cross you uh, back to the UPSC uh, where the NDC uh, general uh, that's the national chairman uh, just addressed what the party calls the true state of the nation address this is the, uh, the, the state of the nation address as was presented by President Okufado is the worst speech that has been delivered. Very shortly, I will get to the General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi yes. Fiavikwete. Um, General, General, briefly, yeah. um, we are live on Joy News. Why, why was it necessary for the NDC to pull together this event? Why was it what? Why was it necessary for the NDC to pull together this event? The President had a constitutional mandate. He's done that. NDC's job is to uh, let the country know what we believe the truth is. Uh, we believe that the president, um, unfortunately, is too, uh, maybe too desperate to hide the true state of affairs. Because all he wants to do is to create a false uh, impression that things are okay. Because the president doesn't want to accept the fact that things are really, really that bad. And uh, so we think we, the country needs to know. Uh, it's important for, for, because if you don't know what the truth is, it's difficult to even know what the solutions will be. And we think the, the, the MPP government, unfortunately, are making every effort to continue hiding the truth, pretending that problems are not what they are and problems are being caused by something else. And the country needs to know what the truth is. The president admits that there's a crisis, but says that his government is fixing it and that the crisis is brought about mainly by COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine. They had also said that that is the true state of the nation address and not what just receiving Getty has painted here. It's pretty obvious uh, for anybody who watches what's going on all over Africa and the sub-region 
that the president clearly is not telling the truth. Uh, if you have a leader who is lying about the real cause of the problem, uh, who refuses to acknowledge that all over the sub-region and all over Africa, other countries are doing very well compared to us, who refuses to accept that no country is facing the kind of crisis we are facing in our sub-region. Obviously, from that premise, you can see already that it's a leader who does not want to tell the truth. In fact, I would say that uh, we should be looking forward to you in the media uh, becoming a bulwark, I mean, to stop what I call the, the serial deception that is going on in this country. Somehow, leaving this to be a battle between NDC and MPP makes it difficult for us to see what the truth is. You need to make it a responsibility to stop whichever side wants to continue lying to be exposed. We have no problem at all if you want to constitute a means by which even NDC will be forced to only tell the truth. And I believe that if we set up a system like that, what will happen is that we we'll sanitize the politics in this country and prevent serial liars that we have in power today from ever occupying the position of leadership. But you continue being quiet, they will continue to prevail. They will lose power in 2024, but somehow they will come back again because you will not continue shining the light to prevent liars like that from ever taking back this, I mean, this country's leadership. So, I mean, this, what we did today is simply to let the country appreciate that the lies must stop. The truth must be told. And that's the only way we will we start having a solution to the problem that faces. Right. Thank you very much. You heard there the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress who is saying that the reason why they had to do this was because the country is in, at a place where if they do not speak the truth, then no one else will do that. I'll try and speak to more persons who are around here to try and get some perspectives as to why the NDC had to do this. You, you, you see a lot of media interviews currently ongoing. The party has made the position clear that they believe that the true state of the nation is what Johnson is saying. The general secretary of the party has just declared. Let me let me try and get and get to um, um, Peter Wama Utukono, is a former deputy general secretary of the NDC. Peter, we are live on Joy News. I mean, why did your former boss have to do this? The president had a clear mandate to go ahead and deliver the state of the nation address. address. On what basis is the NDC saying they are delivering a true state of the nation address? Well, every right and basis we have to deliver the true state of the nation's address. Because indeed, it's not only the president who is uh, in this country. We are all in this country and we are experiencing the brunt of the maladministration of President Akufuado. And we believe strongly that the president and his people have lost touch with reality. And uh, there comes a time where we would have to reawaken the president and his team on the realities on the ground and that is exactly what we have done today so you believe that this is the true state of the nation address the president has ad admitted that the country is in crisis but says his government is working to fix that you would admit that there are measures that are being taken to fix the current crisis the country is facing well, I would have partially agreed with him that the first step to solving the problem is identifying the problem. But indeed, as it stands now, the government and the president himself do not know the problems of this country. And that is why they keep on apportioning sources of the problem. Because you will need to find a source of the problem before you can engineer a solution to the problem. But clearly, the president is misappropriating the source of the problem. And they are, they are blaming the, 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 the causes of the economic crisis, economic you know, quagmire that we are in on the external factors which is not so the government is clearly not being managed well they don't understand what it means to lay a fundamental you know uh, a system for our economy now this government has basically run on borrowing and we have seen how we have outcried this borrowing from the beginning we decried this borrowing from 2017 we said look the way you are going and the way you are you are attaching personal interest to this borrowing we will go into the ditch now we have gotten to a point where our debt to gdp ratio is about 103 percent where your debt has ballooned beyond 600 billion from 122 billion and you ask yourself what has been the results from this borrowing and you see nothing not even a kvip you see nothing all the promises have been you know phantom promises we have seen no outcome of those promises and instead of the government giving us some modicum of respect some modicum of dignity tell us the truth they continue lying they continue peddling more lies thank you very much peter bomber to call peter bomber to call telling us what his true state of the nation is let me reach out to the deputy minority whip ahmed ahmed ibrahim and try and see if i can get a word from um ahmed ibrahim the, the other side have been debating 
the state of the nation address all week in parliament. Honorable, yeah. you have been debating this in parliament for more than a week. Why did your party have to do this? Because the true state of the nation address is what was delivered by President Kufuado as mandated by the constitution. Let me say a very good evening to your cherished viewers. The parliamentary wing is a subset of the Universal Party. So the fact that the parliamentary wing has been debating it does not prevent the Universal Party in taking a position. The national chairman has spoken. And once the national chairman has spoken, he has summarized all the views of the various MPs and the various wing subset of the party. And he has summarized it. Hopelessness and Oh, pleasant and what? <laughs> but what did he say? <laughs> he said he came to say emphatically that I have not been reckless. Now the national chairman has spoken to him that you have been reckless. So now that thing has stuck. And that is the true position of the country. Beyond that, the MPP themselves have said that the vice president is a theoretical economist. And that Alan Chairman is a practical economist. The national chairman of the NDC has also spoken by saying that it's better not to listen to the theory, but he who feels it knows it's better. So clearly what the national chairman has done encompasses all the various atoms of the NDC as a party. And I believe that you yourself, you are fortified and you'll be giving some fresh hope. That come 2024, there will be a change. And the only thing that can save the country now is that there must be a change so that there will be a reaction then we can start again other than that for what we are seeing do you have hope no if you are hungry and your father comes say, oh you are okay meanwhile you yourself you know you are not okay Ghanaians know they are not okay but the president say we are okay are we okay no thank you very much thank you so much. that is the, the the deputy minority whip ahmed ibrahim making it clear why the ndc had to do this they've said that the reason why Johnson and Sedunketia had to put out what they call the true state of the nation address is to sort of put out the true position of what the Ghanaian, the, the, the individual Ghanaian is currently feeling. I'll try and get some more reaction, some more members of parliament just about filing out of this auditorium. And it's, 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 been, it's been 19 pages. And if I, I have the address in my hand now of Johnson and Sedunketia putting out what he calls the true state of the nation address and let me let me speak briefly to Sami Jemfi. Well, okay all right Sami Jemfi says he will he will do so later so blessed that is the state of affairs here at the UPSC auditorium just gone by Johnson and Sadie Nketia delivering a 19 page address of what he calls the true state of the nation address to react to the message that was presented by President Ekufuado only a few days back to Parliament 28th of February actually the president admitted that it was a crisis and that he was working to fix it. And what Johnson is saying has been saying today is that the president clearly is failing or refusing to admit responsibility for the current crisis that the economy is facing. And that the NDC is ready, prepared to take this country out of the economic doldrum and the economic crisis it is currently facing. They are hoping that in 2024, they will be able to win power and in their own words to be able to fix the current challenges. It's been a packed house today. The only person who probably wasn't here today is former president John Mahama, who we understand is on the campaign tour of the Ashanti region, the running mate in the 2020 election. Madam Jane Nana Opoku Ajiman was here. Um, flag bearer's parent, Dr. Kabnadufo was also here. We tried to get some word from him. We couldn't because we were just working our way um, into his waiting vehicle. But the key person, the stalwarts in the NDC have all been here backing their national chairman, Johnson and Sidi Nketiah, and delivering what they call the true state of the nation address. Uh, and uh, quick, quick let, let, just uh, a bit more about the presidential uh, candidates who uh, show, showed up at the event today. Uh, how about uh, Dr. Dufour, in terms of his look, at least we're not able to get a word from him. Uh, what's, what's his feeling about this, this whole uh, address? In Indeed, he was here, Dr. Kamala Dufo was here, and I tried to, to, to try and speak with him. At the time, it wasn't possible because of the security presence just around him. They actually took him out of the auditorium. He went to his waiting vehicle and left. But the sense I'm getting from members of his team who are around is that Dr. Kamala Dufo 
is fully backing the NDC on this matter and that his presence was to signify that. Indeed, he was expecting to present his nomination forms just around this period, around, but because of this event and other events that the party is holding, that has been moved to Thursday. So he expects, Dr. Kamala Dufour expects to submit his nomination forms on Thursday and he was here to offer his full backing to this event. So far, we know that he, he is one of the key contenders of former President John Mahama. John Mahama could not be here. He's in the Ashanti region campaigning. But Kamala Dufour was here to offer his full support to this event. He says that although we couldn't get away from him, but the sense we are getting from the members of his team is that they are clearly in support of the NDC in putting out this statement in delivering what they are calling the true state of the nation address and that in the future when the party has such similar events, Dr. Kamala Dufour is clearly going to back that. Let me, let me try and speak to um, um, Elvis Efriye Ankara, who was also here to try and see if I can get a word or, uh, in terms of what, what his, his view is on the true state of the nation address. So, um, Elvis Efriye Ankara is a former director of elections of the party. He's also, he immediately contested for the general secretary position. Um, Honorable, what are your views on, the, on, the, on this message that has been delivered by your national chairman? The message is on point, it's very relevant, and it reflects the current state of our country. Um, this government has failed. Uh, this government has pushed this country to the brink. Um, our debt situation is unsustainable for the first time in the history of this country. We are not able to pay our debts uh, to the extent that we are to even go into pension funds. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio is over 104 percent. It's never happened before. Um, inflation, even if you are looking at the official figures, is over 54 percent. If you look at the quantum of debts, by the time we were leaving office, uh, the debt portfolio was about 120 billion, and we have things to show for it. Today, our debt portfolio is over 600 billion, with nothing to show for it. And if you look at the prices of goods and services, things that affect the ordinary Ghanaians, which the chairman clearly articulated the prices of kinky, price of roofing sheets, price of cement, just name them, even water, sanitary parts, some have gone up by over 400, 500 percent. It's clearly unsustainable. And the government and the president is not able to define for us a path of recovery. It's like the country is on autopilot. And this is the time for all Ghanaians to arise and speak and ensure that we get these people out come 2024. Thank you very much, Elvis Efriankra. So, that is the lowdown here, Elvis Efriankra, backing up what his chairman has said. But I was making that point there of Dr. Kamala Dufo and his presence here to signify that he's, in, he's fully supporting the party on, on, on this venture to reveal what they call the true state of the nation address. The national chairman, Johnson Nesidin Kutia, spoke for almost an hour. He spoke 19 pages of his speech, clearly labeling some of the misgivings they have, they have about government and what they think government should be able to do to take the country out of the current economic crisis. And quick, I see that some uh, party faithful are also there. Uh, how about getting a sense of what, what they think about the address today? Right, so let me, let me speak to some more people and see what they think about the address. Hello, can I speak to you? We are live on Joy News about what you thought about the speech delivered. Okay, so these group of persons do not want to do that. Let me try and get a few persons on what they believe about the, the state of the nation address. Right, so, I mean, what, what, what are your own views about the message the national chairman of your party delivered today? The, the national chairman, the message he delivered purely was the true state of the nation. He was trying to pinpoint the gaps and the, the loose messages that our people have been preaching. You know, whenever they have the opportunity to come on air or to present the state of nation address to their country, they always come with lots of lies, lots of fallacies, which isn't fine because the citizens deserve to know the true state. They deserve to know what is happening on the grounds. And that's exactly what the chairman did today. Every single thing the chairman said was truthful. Every single thing. So I put a challenge to them. If they think anything is wrong with what the chairman said, they should come out with their vociferations. We are ready to defend the facts. Right. What, what are your own views today of the, the message delivered by Johnson and Sidney Gutierrez? Thank you very much once again for this opportunity. My experience here was very nostalgic. Why? Because 
the president came out and lied through his teeth that everything was moving on smoothly. Meanwhile, it was the other way around. He is always indulging in fanciful jamborees and populism. My brother just said it all. So I really don't want to waste the time of us here. My brother has said it all. And for me to add something little, I would say that the president on the day that he de delivered the State of the Nation address couldn't extrapolate any settler of evidence to buttress what he was saying. He was just indulging in sloganeering uh, as what he is known for. But during this critical time, we don't need such things. We need someone who will be truthful to Ghanaians, someone who will not engage in semantics, someone who will not ride on words to play with the, what, the emotions and the minds of Ghanaians. So my brother, Ghana indeed, we are at crossroads. And at this particular juncture, the only person who can save us from this abyss, from this ineptitude of super incompetence governance, is John Dramani Mahama and the NDC. So come next year, we want to use this opportunity and this channel because we know your channel is very big and it transcends beyond the boundaries of this country to really all Ghanaians that they should come back home and in, indulge in the next election that we are going to have because this is going to be what, like Mahama said, this is the gospel of the NDC and Mahama and anyone at home has owned him or herself up to be an apostle for this gospel. Thank you very much. What are your own thoughts as well? Oh, my own thoughts is this very government should do the necessary things to back up and sack those who are very who is not working very well you see if you change the pre-issue of the, his, the former president i think there was some though there was some issues but he tried to solve everything but despite the fact that if you check this out um, education system is 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 it's very appalling how can a student go to school three months and come and stay at home four months this is not fair so the government should see this whole situation and work on that's what i would say thank you what are your own thoughts so um in my view, I realize that this, the government of the day has no integrity because every day and each day and night they come out to spew lies, deception and then all that. The state of the nation address which was delivered by our president was not the true state but rather the one which was delivered by our party chairperson was the, not the, the actual state of the country. Thank you. thank you. Matthew, what are your own thoughts as well? Uh, actually, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I think currently where Ghana is heading towards is a very, very bad state. That's as a country, we need to rescue our motherland. And for everyone watching me out there, I'm assuring every Ghanaian that the NDC is the only option for elections 2024. So they, sh they should all troop in so that we do this tax together to rescue our motherland Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, these are some thoughts oh, as well. Yeah, what are, your, what, are your, what are your views? Okay, I would like to say a very big thank you for the opportunity. I am here not for politics, but I am talking or, I, as a, a citizen of Ghana, yeah. I'm talking with a perception that these are realities on ground. I came here purposely to get to know all that is going on, despite the fact that this is a political party that is representing. That is giving me the understanding that, okay, these are the true things that they have brought out i mean the realities on the ground that they have brought out for the general public to see that this is how the state of the nation ghana is at this moment and absolutely before i came i went to buy kinky and <laughs> honestly a, a bowl of kinky is selling at four cities and i realized that truly everything they said over here wasn't a lie everybody can testify in this nation so if our folks our politicians are destroying the country or the people in government are destroying the country how about we the youth what are we coming to inherit or what are we coming to do in the near future so i just want to encourage every Ghanaian to believe in the government of the ndc not i'm not i don't have a political party I'm not affiliated with any political party, but at least I came to witness and I realized that nothing over here said is false. Everything is true. So I just want everybody to confide in the NDC to push it for 2024 right. victory. Thank, th you. Th thank you. Let me let me wrap up with this gentleman here. What are, what are your own thoughts about the speech that was delivered today by the chairman of the NDC? Oh, the speech that was delivered today was quite interesting. And I think for us as the youth, it focused more on us. You see, we are the future leaders, as they always say. And with what we came to hear and things, considering the current happenings in the country, I think it's, it's in the right direction. It's a nation we are building. And I think collectively, whether being standing from a political point of view or not, 
we should all think about ways to develop the country. But um, in general, I, I must say it was it was an interesting experience today. Yes, thank you. Th thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, Blessed Soga, live from the UPS Auditorium, the key issues have come up. The NDC have laid out what they think about the true state of the nation address. We've also been hearing from ordinary students, members of TAIN, who, who, have, who have been here to listen to Johnson and Sadie Nketiah deliver that message. And they say that they cannot wait for a future NDC government to take the country out of the economic crisis we are facing currently. Those are their own views. But the NDC themselves say that they are very much ready to take over the reins of governance in Ghana. Santi there, uh, joining us from the UPSA Auditorium. Now, pay up your bills or uh, get disconnected. That's the message coming through from the Electricity Company of Ghana. Uh, the company is on a campaign to recover some 5.7 billion cities in revenue losses. Uh, a number of activities are underway. But first, uh, we understand that a number of institutions have been disconnected already, including the Energy Ministry itself, which supervises uh, this very institution. Listen to the Chief Executive Officer for the Electricity Company of Ghana, uh, Samo Mahama. Look, if you take 10 ECG customers, five will be prepaid, five will be postpaid. Out of the five postpaid, three of them are paying, two are not. Hmm. When you take the prepaid, all are paying, but three of them are doing illegal connections. Unbelievable. You understand? And it's all because of the new digitization drive that we've been on mm. since I became MD. That look, uh, ECG has 2.5 million postpaid customers and 800 meter readers. <laughs> what? 800 meter readers? Yeah. For 2.5 million meters. Yeah. For 2.5 million meters. Yes. So, now, clearly, you know the business model is what? Wrong. So why don't you just hire more? So where do you pay them? Or change the meters. <laughs> where do you pay them from? You have to, you have to, it has to be a carrot and a stick. So you have to find a way to balance. The, there should be a balancing act. Now we're all out. Today I'm doing media. Second half of the day, I'm out there with the teams. So, meters. Hey, and bills. Look, you've received a bill before. Mm -hmm. If we haven't read your meter, you are trying to pay what your last bill was. Keep paying it. It's even good for you. Keep paying it until finally your meter is what read. And then the, there's the what, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And then you start moving from there. Mm. But some people, they haven't come. So, no. But in, even in the case of the SLTs, when I say SLTs, I mean special load tariff customers. That's industry. Mm. We have what we call the AMR. They have their meter. They have people assigned to their meters in their company. We are able to read their meters remotely from our place, yeah. our office. Mm -hmm. So what's the excuse? Hmm. In your budget for the year, you put the electricity as part. I'm sure your business does. Mm -hmm. It's a cost. Mm. But where most people have that, but ECG never receives the money. Then later, when after it's piled up over a period of time, you come with a payment plan. All because it belongs to the government. Attitudinal change has to start now. When it was PDS, I'm sure everybody realized, oh, the matter has changed. It's a private institution now. So when they go back, they start talking about how PDS was doing good with what? Revenue. It's because of our mindset. Hmm. What changed after that? Why do people stop paying? We, we, we talk about fixing problems. We always talk about fixing problems. But when you ask the average Ghanaian, what are you trying to do in your corner to fix the problem? Then you start hearing excuses. Oh, my this, my child that, I had to do this, I pay school fees. Mm. But the thing, you've consumed it. How much yeah. of the 5.7 are you hoping that you can get? 100%. 100%. Yes. <laughs> first things first that I need to put out there is that no ECG stuff, I repeat. No ECG staff is mandated to collect cash. This is a cashless exercise because of the new platform that we have. They are well equipped to generate a paying slip for you to go to the nearest bank and pay. They are well equipped to generate your payment all the way for you to receive a notification to pay by Momo, Vodafone Cash, whatever. 
If you want to pay by bank card, they are well equipped to give you that option. No ECG staff is to collect cash. We've had rumors of people calling people and telling them, look, ECG as a company has suffered. People have registered Momo numbers under the name ECG Cash mm -hmm. Payment Point mm -hmm. and taking money from mm -hmm. unsuspecting what? Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. Please, if it is not an approved ECG collection point. We also know people will try to take advantage of this exercise. So the dial star 226 hash, follow the prompts and verify the ECG staff who came or who has come to your house. Give us that short code again, please. Star 226 hash. And that will help you verify the identity of the ECG staff, staff that has come to the house for the exercise. If okay. you are in doubt. Okay. Truth be told, there are going to be a lot of disconnections. I know. Because I have a feeling some people may try to leverage on one thing or the other. My plea out there is, please, let's stop these phone calls to places or to people to try and intervene because this time around my fear is that it may end up looking like somebody is being recalcitrant or somebody doesn't respect but please you know what you have done you know you have consumed let's not do this to our own company it's very easy to drop the ball at the doorstep of the ECG staff or the ECG team but 5.7 billion Ghana cities, come on. Well, uh, so that's the managing director for the electricity company of Ghana, James Avejo, uh, uh, together with the team uh, monitoring that exercise. James, uh, welcome. So uh, what did we find on the ground? So uh, the, this part of the operation, we know it's a nationwide operation mm. uh, at the district level, the regional level, mm. and the national level. So this part of the operation was led by the National Tax Force mm. team. Mm. Uh, today we visited three state institutions, which are the Parliament House, the Ghana Airport Company Limited, as well as the, uh, the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, which is the GBC. Uh, and uh, what did we find out? So, in total, all three of these state-owned institutions are owing uh, in a total of 46.9 million Ghana cities. Now, when we first visited Parliament, uh, Parliament owes some 13 million Ghana cities. Mm. And so when we went to Parliament, the uh, ECG went there with a uh, motive to actually disconnect Parliament. Mm -hmm. And then they were met by officials of Parliament. And uh, uh, from the interactions initially, uh, they were offering some 1 million Ghana cities to prevent the disconnection, but the ECG wouldn't take that. And so they went into a meeting that lasted about some 15, 20 minutes. And then they came back with uh, the agreement that the parliament has agreed to pay uh, some 8.5 million Ghana cities out of the 13 million Ghana cities. Now, the uh, 5 million out of the 8.5 we were told will be paid through by the finance ministry through the uh, Give Me uh, platform. And so the 3.5 million cities, they wrote a check to that effect to the electricity company of Ghana, but they rejected the check uh, because as we just heard earlier, the managing director saying that uh, the team is now accepting cash or check on the field. Uh, they are accepting uh, electronic transactions. And so uh, the, according to the external uh, manager of external communications of the ECG, they, she told us that they were made, parliament was made to transfer the 3.5 million cities through the electronic system to uh, their account. And so that was the story of parliament. After that, they had to leave parliament without disconnecting their light. And so as we speak, parliament should still be owing some 4.5 million Ghana cities out of the 13 million Ghana cities. So from there, we moved to the Ghana Airport Company Limited. When we got there, the team was met with some resistance from the securities uh, in the premises. Mm. They accused us of invading their premises mm. because they have not been informed of our presence there. And so it led to some sort of scaffold between the media team as well as especially and, and the security uh, uh, personnel who said we do not have to film anything on the ground. And so it led to a bit of scaffold for about some five, seven minutes, uh, prompting the attention of officials or the management 
uh, to come to the ground. And so it led to another meeting with the uh, uh, ECG officials. Now, the Ghana Airport Company Limited were told, as at last year's operation, this is the, the second in recent time the ECG is undertaking this operation. So as at uh, the last operation, which was undertaken last year, they were owing some 48 million Ghana cities. And so they paid 20 million out of that, owing some 28 million cities uh, uh, to the ECG. And so what they were doing was that they were paying the, their current bills after that exercise. And so for the current bills, they do not owe anything, but in arrears, they owe 28 million Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from that meeting, after the meeting, they have agreed to uh, pay 10 million cities. And so they also made that payment upfront through electronic transactions to the uh, ECG systems. And so as we speak, they are also owing some 10 million Ghana cities out of the tw uh, uh, out of 18 million Ghana cities, sorry, out of the 28 million Ghana cities uh, 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 from the Ghana Airport Company Limited. And so that was the story of the uh, two state institutions. And so we terminated the day at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. We were told they were also owing in arrears of 5.9 million Ghana cities. It was more than that, but government paid some 17 million Ghana cities as of last year, leaving an arrest of 5.9 million Ghana cities. And they also adopted the strategy of paying current bills, and so they do not owe any current bill. Now, what we picked up from the interaction between the GBC uh, or, uh, manage, management as well as the ECG was that uh, they reached an agreement with the energy ministry through the information ministry that the 5.9 million Ghana cities arrests will be paid by the government this year. Mm. And so there was no need to disconnect them. And that also led to another discussion and a meeting which lasted some few minutes. And then the ECG came back uh, to tell us that uh, the agreement they had with the energy ministry through the finance ministry last year still stand. And so they will continue paying their current bill while the 5.9 will be outstanding. Mm -hmm. And then they will uh, see how, as at when government has the money, they will pay that. So that's what day one of the exercise led by the national tax force has been. And so they have been taxed to visit all state owned agencies who owe the ECG. And so it resumes tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, in all, the three uh, state-owned agencies owed a total of 46.9 million Ghana cities. They have been able to retrieve 18.5 mil 18 million Ghana cities. I think they are left with about some 28 or 24.4 uh, uh, million Ghana cities to pay. Okay. Uh, James Aveji, thank you for the update. Adam Yakubu is with the Institute for Energy Security. Uh, he's joining us via Zoom. Thank you for your time. Uh, this mass disconnection exercise, would it really yield uh, much more revenue for uh, ECG that has always had this trajectory of indebtedness? Uh, Adam, if you can hear me, I'm asking if this will make any difference in terms of the mass disconnection exercise we're looking at here. Yeah, so good afternoon to you and good afternoon to your listeners. Um, so first of all, let's commend the ECG for taking this initiative as it would uh, help at yeah. least mobilize some of the revenue that uh, that is owed by the institution. And I believe that uh, this should be done regularly instead of doing it annually, then it's done once annually, then it is repeated. If we do it regularly, I'm sure that even companies that owe the ECG would, would be prompted to pay up the, the areas they owe the institution. And so this is this is an initiative that should be commended, yeah. But, but will that really yield uh, to an increment in the revenue uh, of, of the institution? It's always been a challenge for them. They've, they've carried out uh, similar exercises in the past. So even though it, it, it might not augment the effort, but at least they say the the a uh, uh, little drops of water makes the mighty ocean. If today they've been able to get some money from parliament, they've been able to get something from a uh, Ghana airports company like your reporter, at least for today, the, the revenue numbers would come up. And so if the process is going to be repeated throughout the, the month, I believe by the end of the month, if they, they should look at the numbers, it should be encouraging. So that is why I'm saying it shouldn't just be a one-off activity. It should be something that should be done periodically and like the uh, MD stated that uh, the number of 
employees to monitor even the meters is a challenge and so they are constrained that is why the the, the digitization drive that they have taken is really commendable and that should be encouraged greatly given the fact that we are living in a technological era we can still be given excuses of people are not available to check the meters what then do we do we have complained for far too long and so it is a time that we should be acting and not still be complaining Thinking about some of these state institutions uh, involved, even the energy ministry itself, uh, it raises questions about uh, the posture of government institutions, isn't it? Yeah, so on the issue of state agencies owing, um, we believe that it is about time that uh, the ECG be privatized to allow efficiency in a sense that, you know, oftentimes when these issues come up, there's always an issue of government has intervened. I remember, I think somewhere last year when Valco was shut down, they, it took the president to intervene to be able to negotiate for Valco to be reopened. And so it should tell you that um, it is about time that we, we allow some private participation in the management of ECG, given the fact that it does about 85% of the revenue of the uh, energy distribution value chain. Mm. And you know that if ECG's numbers are not doing well in terms of revenue, it affects Gridco, which is the, the transmission, and it affects the, the, uh, fuel, generate, the fuel suppliers as well as the, 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 the IPPs or private generators. So it is not just ECG that is, is being affected by these revenue shortfalls. All those actors within the power value chain are equally affected, power supply in terms of fuel, um, distribution in terms of Gridco, then ECG itself, its operations, maintenance, and also investment are all constrained. And so we should all encourage that these activities be consistent and be repetitive and not one of like it is done. Mm. Okay. Uh, and, and the way forward uh, for ECG to bring about innovation and to sustain, of course, uh, it's uh, revenue mobilization posture. What, what do you recommend from the position of our So youth? one thing I have observed this morning, I was listening to the news somewhere in the north. There's still not much understanding of the activities of these new meters and the digitization drive. So I would encourage that uh, the, the MD should put much focus on sensitizing people to understand that the ECG is an institution that stands to generate revenue and it is on the back of this revenue that the institution operates so if you don't pay your bills and the lights begin to go off you cannot blame the ecg rather it is when you pay your bills they have enough money that they can invest to ensure that your lights are, are sustained so one of the things i would want them to do immediately is a massive sensitization drive because i listened to the program which was carried in the local dialect and most of contributors who called into the program didn't even understand what the ECG is doing or how the meters operate and so and I believe that there are even equally people living in urban areas who equally don't understand how the the activities of ECG and its operations work so if they they are doing this they should also do massive sensitization exercises on their activities I believe this way it it enlightens people, and on the part of part of government, we should be looking at how does private sector come into the management of ECG, so that there there is no excuse of state agency owing a state agency, but state agency owing a private investor who would go after you at all length to take his money. Uh, and the electronic transaction they've adopted this time uh, will that protect the pairs? Yes, to a larger extent, we, we that might say that that is very innovative and clever in a yeah. sense that over the years, people people go out there in the name of doing mass disconnections. We hear later they were paid some monies. Look at how interesting human beings, they pay monies for the lights not to be disconnected, but will not be taken out of their areas. So the person is comfortable to bribe the team or whatever and not be ready to pay part of the bill. And so I think that the, the decision of not taking cash at the spot, I don't know how you are going to, to cheat the system if they are not taking cash mm. or check. So definitely it is, it is something that we need to comment in. Right. So ECG, thumbs up, they should keep it up. And we okay. believe that. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us uh, here on The Post, and I'm grateful uh, for your time.
I'm grateful. We'll be right back. Please stay. And you're welcome back now. A member of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, Paul Chumberma, is asking the NDC to desist from politicizing the gold for oil deal. Government in recent times has claimed that the reason for which uh, the prices of fuel uh, is reducing at the pump should be attri attributed to this innovative uh, move to exchange gold for oil. But the NDC disagrees. Commenting on the matter, Paul Chumberma says the policy is yielding results. In the first place, I mean, let's, let's establish this attitude of using politics for everything. Why is that when the prices are going up, it's government? Whenever there's a hike in price, government is the cause of this hike. But when people see reduction, that is not government. I think it is it's about time we, we move away from this um, um, politics and, and let's help build our country. There is a policy that is helping solve our challenges in our fuel sector um, um, area as well as our forest um, 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 sector. Let's applaud the government. Let's give it to the government and encourage the government to do more. You don't, you don't, you don't try in a way to, 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 to take the shine, knowing well whether it's, it can happen. We were in this country some few months ago. We were buying fuel at a at a at a 20 20 something cities per liter then the same people said no government it's a, it's a cost of government it's a cost of the forest everything is government then government came back and said okay yes i take up this challenge i'll work at it then the government did it best came up with this policy good for oil policy has to if, if I may say, two, two, uh, two lines or two areas that they are targeting. One, is solving the price of fuel. And two, also solving these fluctuations in terms of our forest or our, 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 in terms of our forest exchange, which is increased. It goes, just a fluctuations that comes in. I will not say everything should be attributed to good for oil um, policy. But it is it is a factor. It's a major factor for this because the part in terms of stabilizing the dollar is one area that is uh, causing us to sustain this fuel pricing. Well, the MP is also asking the transport ministry to dialogue uh, with GPR to you so that prices uh, of transport services across the country uh, would be reduced. So with the prices of uh, transport or uh, transportation prices being stable, indeed, um, we were, it, we need to appeal to the transport minister to sit with the appropriate associations or groups to be able to look at this. But also don't forget that uh, some of some of them will say that as at the time your reduction was coming, they bought certain things that they bought at a higher price. So it's like I want to sell this my mobile phone. I bought it about four thousand. Then in about two weeks they reduce it to two thousand cities. You're not expecting to reduce it to two thousand. Because then I've lost about two hundred and fifty percent or hundred percent of my own money. So clearly we 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 need to manage certain group of people. And I think the transport minister must come in in this area. That's the only way that because, yes, at the time petrol was high. Some people may have had an accident. They have to fix their car. They fix at a high cost. Some people may also uh, may have to change a lot. I mean, some people may have lost even their jobs. So coming back, you need to balance it well. And it must be a 50-50 thing. So I think the way the Minister of Transport sat down with them when the prices were high and came into a concern, some 
consensus. We will appeal to the transport minister to also sit with them to come up with, to a consensus that, okay, obviously, let's share the course here. I mean, we, the people are also, um, when it mattered, they came in. So at this point, you also have to, I mean, come in for us. So then we can be able to achieve, but I will not really blame them a lot when it comes to that, that area because I think we need to look at it. It's a 50-50 something that we have to look at it. And let's turn our attention to some other stories because Ghana is joining over 80 countries around the world to mark the formation of the international organization La Francophonie. The country is originally not a French-speaking one, but given uh, the fact that our neighbors uh, are all former colonies of the French, uh, President Akufado is paying attention to normalizing and increasing ties with the community. Earlier today, there was a flag-raising ceremony in which uh, both uh, parties and countries pledged to increase cooperation. Well, it's said to be a long week of jubilation and celebration for over 300 million French-speaking people around the world. They've come together under the organization called La Francophonie. Ghana may not originally uh, be a part of the French-speaking countries, but by association and given the fact that it's surrounded by French-speaking countries, it has formally joined La Francophonie. Earlier today at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration of Flag Raising Ceremony was held where Lebanon's ambassador to Ghana, who doubles as the president of La Francophonie here in Ghana, Maya Kier, called for increased partnership between Ghana and La Francophonie. It makes a lot of sense for us to have a special relationship with the French countries and with France as well. So that's the reason for, war, for our interest in La Francophonie. These are our close neighbors and for us to be able to relate with them in a good way. We ought to go beyond language and language is very important instrument for serious communication between any people. Indeed, His Excellency the President plays this instrument perfectly as he continues to push for reform that will make Ghana a multicultural destination. We commend the president for his futuristic vision in supporting the Francophonie to help Ghana play a vital role within Africa and the international scene. Also, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Shirley Ayokobuchi, pledged Ghana's support to be friendly with the rest of the French-speaking people. She, however, called for increased participation and programs that will enable more Ghanaians adapt to the French culture. Our delight in belonging to this robust organization founded on such noble principles as the promotion of the French language, culture and linguistic diversity, the promotion of peace, democracy and human rights, which are at the core of our constitution cannot be overemphasized. We share in the need to support education, training, higher education and research as we are committed to enhance economic cooperation between us and the five continents of the Francophonie world in pursuit of sustainable development. Considering that La Francophonie accounts for over 1.5 billion people, represents one third of UN member countries, and Africa has the largest number of French speakers accounting for 55 percent of the continental population, we are happy to say that Africa holds a key to the future of La Francophonie. I believe La Francophonie is more poised than ever to take up the challenges of the 21st century through economic cooperation and the development of cultural and creative industries in the quest for a better life for the younger generation. We are happy to be part of this drive, which aligns with the vision of the government of Ghana. Blessed Sudan reporting for Joy News, Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration Ministry, Accra.
And now the Ghana Armed Forces says it is taking steps to address challenges that hinder the deployment of women into peacekeeping operations. There's more in this report. According to the UN, women play a key role in peacekeeping, but the number of women in peacekeeping operations in Ghana is low. The Ghana Armed Forces Project Coordinator, Kennel William Abuchi, stated that it is very essential to encourage more women to join the armed forces without limiting them based on gender roles. The high numbers want to apply already, but we want them to apply to go to the combat and the combat support units. Now, the research found out that majority of our women are in the service support units, nurses, clerks, signal women, and all that. So you hardly see women in infantry, in ammo units, and in airborne. So we have to tell them that the opportunities are there. If you want to be whatever you want to be, apply. You can be taken and you achieve your dream. He also revealed that the project intends to institutionalize gender training in the Ghana Armed Forces, which will equip soldiers on gender issues before they graduate. We first try to institutionalize gender training in Ghana Armed Forces. This wasn't there. Once in a while, there could be a course here or there. Now, we identified four levels which we can do this. The basic entry level for recruits and officers, young soldiers level and young officers level, senior NCOs course levels and junior staff course division, and then sergeant majors courses, and then senior staff course for officers. So by doing this, we expect that by the time any soldier comes into the system and operates for four or five years, you would have been gender aware, and your culture would have been influenced, and you will create a better or a gendered working conditions for everybody in the Ghana Armed Forces. Program Officer for Women, Peace and Security Institute at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Centre, Agnes Agbevadi, is optimistic that Ghana's armed forces would develop and implement a policy addressing the most pressing gender issues. I mentioned that as part of the intervention um, to achieve that this project is to um, help Ghana Armed Forces to have a gender policy. Gender policy, a comprehensive one, of course, that will guide the process of mainstream agenda in Ghana Armed Forces. We are looking at a number of things, and that has to do with the promotion, recruitment to Ghana Armed Forces, paternity leave, maternity leave. A lot of things will come on board, discussing within this um, uh, framework of developing the uh, policy for Ghana Armed Forces. And this, at the end of the day, we believe will be accepted by the top leadership, and it will be adopted. The team has visited about 10 garrisons so far, and about 14,000 military and civilian employees have been sensitized. Jacqueline and Suma Yeboe's report read to you. And Ghana's quest to commercialize uh, science and technologies under threat. The country is currently ranking 95 out of 132 countries. Samuel Mbura now reports. The latest ranking was revealed at a stakeholder engagement on the commercialization of science technology and innovation research in Accra. Ghana's score of 95 is an improvement over the previous score of 112 in 2021. But experts are convinced that the country is far behind schedule on its target of commercializing science and technology. Technical advisor to the Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, Oliver Boachi said they are working on the passage of a law which when approved not less than 1% of GDP will be allocated for science, technology and innovation research. Ghana is so far behind countries such as Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda and others. And we need to uh, improve on that. And that is why we are doing what we are doing. First, ensuring that uh, we have passed a law which now says that when it is implemented, uh, not less than 1% of uh, Ghana's GDP is going to be allocated uh, for the development and application of science, technology, and innovation to ensure that all uh, uh, research that is funded uh, by government, whether it's in the public research institutions and the universities, 
are aligned with national priorities. The Global Innovation Index is an indication on how countries are investing in the use of science, technology and innovation to drive their economies. It takes into consideration how much GDP has been applied to the development of science and technology as well as the capacity building of manpower in the country. But what are governments in other countries doing to ensure adequate use of technology and innovation to contribute to economic growth through the commercialization of science and research? One country in the world known for technological advancement is Israel. High Commissioner of Israel to Ghana, Shlomit Sofa, shares some of the measures adopted by the Israeli government. Well, Israel is uh, branding itself as the innovation nation for a good number of years now. And I believe that what we do and the element that is crucial to our success is that there is a lot of government support, government funds and um, ecosystem that supports the private sector, that supports the accelerators, the labs and the hubs in a way that would allow businesses and young entrepreneurs to fall, to fail, get up on their feet again and continue with the journey because it is um, often happens that uh, young businesses, young entrepreneurs, they do not succeed with their first operations and they need to have the support of the government to move forward, to move onward. And this is in Israel one of our strengths in our innovation ecosystem. Heritas Lab serves as early detectors of happiness in the ecosystem to guide key stakeholders on sectors to meet science, technology and innovation targets. Its CEO, Deridin Dazi, says they will continue to amplify awareness and facilitate stakeholder engagements towards the commercialization of science, technology, innovation in Ghana. We at Heritas Labs, what we are doing is to first provide the initial discovery um, to serve as early detectors, anticipators, letting the ecosystem and key stakeholders understand what um, is happening in the ecosystem and what key areas and key sectors um, that they should be interested in and investing or where we need a lot of activity. Um, the other thing that we do, we try to facilitate um, the ecosystem co coordinating um, the activities in the ecosystem we also try to accelerate, ensure that we meet our STI target or science, technology, innovation target at a faster rate because as a nation, we need to move faster than, than the average. Meanwhile, 2023 to 2033 has been declared a decade of innovation by the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation which will see to the establishment of the Ghana Innovation and Research Centers across the country to provide manpower skills training and the necessary tools for science, research and innovation. Samuel Mbura reporting for Joy News. And Joy News is learning that the Bream River is almost drying up. From what our cameras captured, it appears that the fight against illegal mining is being lost. My colleague Samuel uh, Kujo Brace uh, has been to the area and now reports. Deep in the forest, somewhere in the Kwaibibri municipality of the eastern region, illegal miners work to their equipment. Give up. They destroy cocoa farms and palm plantations in search for gold. This is a cocoa plantation in Abakan. It's, it's a community close to Kede and very near the Birim River. Now, the cocoa trees are being cut down by illegal miners. Now, if you can see right behind me, there's a, a, a pumping machine belonging to these illegal miners. There's a, a gallon. Now, what we've seen here indicates that these people were mining some few minutes ago but just when they heard that uh, the police is heading this area they bolted leaving their machine we've seen the excavators that they were using to do this daniel is the son of a farmer whose cocoa farm has been destroyed 
papa to coin. Tea by on the fifth. On my friend, on my car, by assassin or so. Nay, new and tea. may buy fifth on the sixth. Pay a Monday, and I may buy sighter. May buy two machines, me, you know. I traveled with my father and returned on the 5th. Some people informed us that some Galamseers have invaded our land. So I came here on the seat to check, but they didn't see anyone working, despite their machines being here. The following day, I brought the CID officers to pick them up, and they were warned to stop working. He says the illegal miners continue to operate, despite several warnings from the police. But they didn't heed to the warning, but they continued. That's why we have brought you here. Kwajo Oforiata is a lawyer of a cocoa farmer who has been affected. I think seeing this is quite sad. I mean, we all have witnessed what we are seeing here. Quite sad. Uh, what um, I would suggest that since individual fights in this menace will not solve the problem the community has to come together with the backing of the uh, law enforcement agencies in the community the police the national security the dc or the mce so that they will make sure that this um, natural resource we have you know we have um, cocoa and other um, oil palm even here mm -hmm. it can be protected well other than that we are destroying our own river. You know, Brim is just yeah. behind yeah. what we can see here. So, as we say, in a country that is the second largest producer of cocoa, if cash not taken, Galamse will push the country off that patch. Because today, in every nook and cranny, where there is a possibility of finding gold, Galamse, I don't mind cutting down cocoa trees just so they could have access to gold. This is in Kede, around the Birim River. But the river itself has been so polluted, it looks so muddy, and nothing else can be done in terms of it supporting human and plant life. From Kede, for Joy News, I am Samuel Kojobrace. The Ghana AIDS Commission says it's facing financial difficulties in getting antiretroviral drugs uh, for the fight against uh, the disease. There's more in this report. For the debriefing meeting for the midterm review of the National TB and HIV Strategic Plans 2021 to 2025, is meant to examine the progress and shortfalls of the implementation process. The National HIV Strategic Plan is aimed at diagnosing 95% of people with HIV, 95% of people diagnosed to be put on antiretroviral medication, and 95% of people on the antiretroviral medication reaching a non-transmission stage by 2025. The meeting brought together government entities, private sector operators, and civil society to review the progress of work and to chart the way forward. Speaking at the forum, the Director General of the Ghana AIDS Commission, Dr. Chemi Etuyane, said even though Ghana is making progress, lack of funding is impeding work. And the key highlights has clearly, clearly shown that um, we are on course in terms of the trajectory of various indicators. For example, new infections are declining, AIDS deaths declining uh, across ages and gender. Uh, uh, we are also seeing increasing uptake of services. We are seeing the number of people living with HIV who are being diagnosed going up. Uh, number of uh, people receiving antiretroviral treatment, both adults and children, also going up. So these indicators clearly show that we are making progress. But the progress, the pace of the progress is so slow that we are still uh, underperforming. And the main reason for this is that we are not making adequate investment uh, to give us the, re the response, uh, the, re the, the results that we, we, we seek to achieve. 
Dr. Etienne also called on individuals and private sector to donate to the HIV fund to support the fight against the viral disease. Yes, we have 60% deficit in funding and that accounts for the slow pace of progress of the AIDS response. Uh, and so what we are doing is to work with government. Government has set up AIDS fund. That fund must be resourced. And so uh, we, we, besides government, we know the economic situation. Government cannot do it all. And so the private sector, the general public must all contribute. And so the commission, which is the custodian of the fund, uh, has put in place the necessary mechanisms to enable people to contribute. So we have uh, a short code for uh, donation into the fund by, you know, uh, the normal uh, uh, electronic transfer uh, platform or arrangement. And 9898 is actually one of our targets from 2025 to 2030 that will be our target and so we want all Ghanaians to appreciate the fact that the 9898 target must be achieved and if it has to be achieved then we must achieve we must uh, uh, address the 66 percent uh, funding gap or deficit uh, in order for us to achieve these targets. And we count on all Ghanaians uh, to support the uh, AIDS fund. Program manager for the National AIDS STI Control Program, Dr. AC Addo, said HIV is still prevalent, hence the need for people to be cautious. In the year 2022, when I announced that the number of people we've identified as positive by half year was 24,000, a lot of Ghanaians were afraid and running health as kept and people were asking as follow-up whether indeed HIV was real or was still around. I said HIV is around despite the fact that COVID-19 had overshadowed everything. And I promised them that by the end of the year, I think the figure may double. And I'm happy to announce, ladies and gentlemen, that by the end of December, 2022, we've identified 49,500 new cases, almost 50,000 new infections. Now, this is after we had taken away those who had retested. This is to let you know that HIV is serial and transmission is going on. So, the figures that were provided as new infections, you know. It will interest you to know that for the children, almost 20%, 19% of that came from children. If you take the estimated population of people living with HIV, 7%, however, are children, majority females. And that's all we have for you here at the polls. I am Blessed Sogan Logan to myjoyonline.com. We have updates for you. Guys.